Good to go. Glad you're here this morning for Missions Day. This is a big deal. Uh, lots of congregations, I know of several who are having a Missions Day today. They've had Mission Month during the month of October, special collections, that kind of thing going on. I know you've got one today as well. $20,000 is the goal, and that's admirable. That's exciting, and I've been praying about that. And we're looking forward to hopefully reaching that goal so we can just do more mission work in God's world. What I want to do for a few minutes this morning is talk to you about our work called Key to the Kingdom. Uh, there are some little one-page handouts down here. If you would like to know more about the things we're going to talk about today, pick up one of these. They're here and also on the front row on this side. Key to the Kingdom is a mass media ministry that focuses on broadcasting God's message to the world. We preach and teach on television through Facebook, through local satellite stations out of Amarillo, Texas. That's where Becky and I live. And we broadcast those messages various places. And Specifically, this congregation is interested in the work in India. And I'm going to share that with you and kind of the update as to what we're doing in that nation of India. Uh, <clears throat> there we go. For those of you who don't know your geography... Uh, India is here, China is this way, you've got the Indian Ocean, Bay of Bengal here, Arabian Sea. You're working just fine a while ago, Jared, there we go, maybe. Specifically, we work in the state called Telangana. The capital is Hyderabad, a city of about 10 million people. And that's where we have been working for about 17 years. All right, we're hung up here, partner. From Hyderabad, we travel about 90 miles to Surya Pit. And that's where a lot of our ministry work continues on. And we'll talk about that here in a few minutes. We have the Hope Campus there where we have... Uh, the feeding center, the leadership school, the Bible school, the clinic. We see a number of people. Surrey Pets, about 500,000 people or thereabouts. They do have one traffic light, uh, which is, is amazing. I can't describe the traffic. The traffic is um, interesting. You've got to be there to understand how it works. Um, that's a typical scene, driving down the road. Fifteen people in a, in a goods carrier. Lots of people ride on top of buses. I've seen people riding on top of trains going down the countryside. Uh, there's another goods carrier with a fella. You can see him in the back looking at his phone, cell phone. I always try to look at my cell phone when I'm driving inside the car. But he's doing it as... as uh, on the outside. This is why we work in India. India is a very religious nation. This is the Hanuman God, the, the monkey God, if you will. Probably 170, 80 feet tall. There are numerous thousands of gods, idols, and images scattered throughout India. And the people worship these. Oftentimes the idea is the more God you have, the more blessing you're going to receive from that particular God. Well, we are there to share them with Him, hopefully, about the good news of the one true God that we know and that we worship and we honor even today. We have what I would call nine areas in which we work, or nine, or ten, ten buckets in which we work, ten different areas. And you'll find that in a pyramid type of format on these sheets. We start at the top and go down, and so I'll try to just go through some of that for the next few minutes and leave some time for questions. 
As you know, we always begin with the most important thing. And everything that we try to do in India is based upon the Word of God. What does the Bible teach us about mission work or about how we are to live our lives? And based upon what the Bible states, then that is what we do. So we use 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2 as a precedent for preaching the Word of God. We broadcast on television in India in the Telugu language, which is the third most spoken language in India behind Hindi, and then English is number two. We broadcast on television to a potential audience of some 30 million people two times every week. A typical television station. I, I check with them every time I'm in India. Uh, that is a picture of... Uh, of a screen that I found in a motel room. I took a picture. That's what it looks like in India. Uh, this is my wife. She's with me. Uh, on, the, on my right is Jonathan Rettenham, and then Deepa is his wife. Jonathan has been the coordinator of all of our efforts for 17 years in India. I work with him regularly. I trust him. He trusts me. We were texting back and forth at 8.30 last night, working on things in India. He's a good, reliable man. He's a good preacher and teacher as well. I put this picture here because you'll see the timings of their services, from 9 to 12 and then from 3 to 7. How's that for a seven-hour Sunday of worshiping and studying God's Word? That's the desire and the interest and the passion that these people have in India for the Word of God. After we preach the Word, well, we make disciples of those who respond. On average, we were, prior to COVID, receiving about 700 requests for Bibles and Bible studies through the television broadcasting. That's great. We have an office staff in Hyderabad that follows up to all of those requests. We work with the village preachers to do the follow-up, to teach, to baptize, to make disciples. And so that is the precedent that we are using to follow through. Now, what happened with COVID? India is a nation of about 1.3 5 billion people, the second most populous nation in the world next to China. They will soon overtake China as being number one. Prime Minister Modi shut down the nation of India a year and a half ago when COVID hit. Nobody goes anywhere. Now, how do you think that would go? The Prime Minister telling 1.4 billion people to stay home for six weeks. That's what they did. Well, we thought, what's going to happen to our work? What happens when you can't go anywhere and you have to stay home? You watch more what? Television. I told you a moment ago we were receiving about 700 responses, requests for Bibles and studies. During COVID, the number doubled. It didn't go down, it doubled. We were dealing with 1,500 requests for Bibles and studies every month. A silver lining in the COVID in India. We partially support 50 preachers. We have hundreds of other preachers who receive no support, but who are actively involved in teaching the people and having these Bible studies. You'll see Jonathan here in the middle, some of our office staff, the Bible studies here that we distribute. These are some of the 50 preachers. Uh, happen to get a couple of us there in the middle that are not Indian preachers. Uh, that's what we look like. They're in Surya Pit. We are baptizing through the work of these Indian preachers between two and three people per day. Roughly a thousand people per year are being immersed into Jesus Christ. And as a result, the churches are growing, as you could well imagine. There are some 300 or so churches that have been started or that have some kind of connection to, to the work of Key to the Kingdom. 
Well, you preach the word, you make disciples, you got to train the leaders. I've told Jonathan, I said, it's important that we don't just baptize people, but we make disciples of them. And that's important. What happens if the money dries up? What happens if persecution comes to India? What happens if, and fill in the blanks, how many of those 1,000 people per year who are being baptized are truly committed to following Jesus as one of His disciples? That's important. And so I've told Jonathan, don't give me numbers on, on baptism. Give me some numbers on disciples. We'll talk more about that in, in the second hour. Well, we need trained leaders then to provide the spiritual base and foundation for those churches. And so we are on a regular basis through our leadership schools training those elders. I wrote a series of lessons several years ago, eight hours worth of video teaching on spiritual leadership, what it means to be an elder in India. They're using that and some other lessons that they have. We have over 100 men who have been taught and trained who are now the foundation, the support for those churches out in the villages. <clears throat> Five of our teachers, Jonathan you see here, his father in the middle, three other men, there's one man who's not in the picture, but we have these six primary teachers who are teaching and training and preparing the men to go back out and to be the leaders in those village churches. This is all done here in Surya Pet, the Hope Leadership School. Everything that we do there at the campus of Surya Pet, probably about two acres or so, is based upon hope. We're seeking to give spiritual and physical hope to the people of India. And there are one, two, three teachers, four, and then five, six. The rest of these are the men who are currently engaged in this process. We train 20 men per year. They come for 10 days out of the month, and they receive that training, and then they go back into the villages and provide the, the foundation for those churches. Everything I've just said preach the word, make disciples, and train leaders is a spiritual aspect of our effort. Roughly one half of the monies that are sent to India from people like you go to fulfill those three goals. The other half goes to the other seven buckets that we're going to look at now, ways that we can serve and bless the people of India. So we start with serving the needy. We have a Hope Health Services clinic and a medical van that goes with it. Here is the clinic. used to be an old hospital. We have revamped it a little bit, and we're just using it as a basic place for which people can get some medicinal helps. Flu, cold, cough, respiratory, antibiotics, that kind of thing. And we will see up to 700 people per month through this clinic. It's a free clinic. Oftentimes the, the um, pharmacist will go with the preacher out to the villages, to the people who cannot get into Surya Pet. They'll preach, they'll teach, and then afterwards set up this mobile clinic where the people in that village can get some help. Secondly, we welcome the neglected based on James 1.27, a familiar passage, no doubt. We have the Hope Care Center. We just celebrated four years of operating the, operating the care center where we help take care of those who are elderly and poor. It's a 7,100 square foot facility. That's what it looks like. And inside we have 30 elderly people who have no place to live. 20 women and 10 men. They live in places like this. It's similar to a college dormitory room. 
We have seven or eight of these rooms. The people like to be together. But here are the women. That's what it looks like. All of their belongings they are either wearing or on some shelves over here. That's all they have. Two sets of clothes. That's it. These are the men outside of the care center. These people have been rejected by their families. Some of the families have taken over their home. They expelled them from their own village because primarily they've given their life to Jesus Christ. They're Christians. And so they have no place to live. And that's why this care center was built, paid for, completely furnished four years ago to help people like that. We empower the people based on Galatians chapter 6, verse 10, another passage with which you are familiar. We offer sewing machines and benevolent helps to those in need. Every year we distribute 30 of these treadle-style sewing machines to widows, to women of the, the wives of the preachers, and they are used out in the villages to make clothing for their children to make clothing for the communities they can sell and help provide for their family. How many of you know what a treadle-style sewing machine is? And many hands, no hands under the age of 40 go up. I understand that. We give 30 per year. To date, we've given 430 sewing machines to women. And it's making a big difference. Here is the wife of one of our preachers teaching her daughter how to make clothes there in their own home. We give out clothing and helps to the people who live not only in the care center, but to other people as well. The church in Hyderabad, where Jonathan is a member, his family attends, they took this project on themselves. They don't always rely on money that comes from America. This is a benevolent effort that they put forth. Once a year, they provide a set of clothes for those 30 people living in that care center. We feed those who are hungry. You're familiar with that passage from Jesus in Matthew chapter 25. We have what is called the Hope Feeding Center. And this started about a year and a half ago when the COVID situation hit. And so many people lost their jobs. They had to stay home. Many people in India worked from one day to the next. They have just enough money to take care of their family today and tomorrow. And so the big need was, we have many people who aren't working. They have no food. And so we decided to help feed those who were in need. We can't feed everybody. But right now... We are feeding some 50 people per day, either with groceries or with a hot meal. And that's so wonderful. Uh, Jonathan was sending pictures to me last night about distributing this food and serving meals in a situation like that in pouring rain. And the people showed up to get food. Our workers were just wet. But people are hungry, and we're feeding those who are in need. The very same thing that Jesus told us to do there in Matthew chapter 25. We have a congregation in the Northwest, heard about the need. They've been helping with Key to the Kingdom for a long time, and they said, we want to feed the hungry. And they have just this past week committed to another, a third series of six months sending a large amount of money to take care of this very need. How can people hear the Word of God if their stomach is empty? How can they be in tune with what God is doing in their life through Jesus Christ if they're looking for something to eat? And so based here in Syria Pet at our campus, the people are receiving their meals. We have preachers in contact with them. We are serving them as they come and receive food. It's not much. White rice, 
a few vegetables perhaps, some dal, gravy is what we would call it. But it's enough to keep them going from one day to the next. We try to encourage the members. That's another bucket that we would have. 1, Corinthians, or 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 11. This large meeting facility, we take care of some orphans from time to time. Here on the right-hand side, on the other side of this wall, those are the rooms where the elderly people live, the men and the women. What you're seeing there is the other half of the care center. It's about 3,500 on each side of that wall. This is a big meeting place. When I am there, the churches come, the preachers come, we have lectures, we have meetings. Uh, it's a great facility that's used on a regular basis, not just when, when I'm there, but on other occasions as well. These are some of the orphans that we try to help on a regular basis. It doesn't take much money to, to help an orphan. Uh, even the elderly people. It's about $100 per month to take care of one elderly person in India. We have 30 people. That's $3,000 a month to take care of the elderly people in that care center. $3,000 a month would barely take care of one adult person here in America in a nursing facility. Am I right? The dollar goes so far in India. The contributions that you send are multiplied 10, 15 times to make a difference in the lives of those people over there. We help sustain the preachers as well. Based on Romans 10, 14 and 15, you're familiar with, with that passage. We offer some portable speaker units, some amplifiers if you will. As the preachers go out into their villages and teach and preach, they need some kind of way to, to broadcast to larger audiences. And so we offer some of these amplifiers, speaker units for them. And then we also give bicycles to the preachers. As with the sewing machines, we have given out 430 bicycles to preachers. They're oftentimes seen as the primary means of transportation. People don't have cars. Out of all the people we work with, up to a thousand people that we work with in India, not one person has an automobile. A handful, maybe half a dozen, have a motorbike. But they rely on these bicycles for the preachers to go back and forth among their congregations. Every preacher will have two to three congregations that they will see about. Those congregations range between 30 and 50 people each. And how do you get there? They're four to six kilometers away from where they live. And so they need these bicycles. These bicycles cost $75 a piece. They're good bicycles. They're sturdy. They last several years. And they're making a difference in their lives. There's a young lady here in Farmington who took it upon herself. You know her name, Lauren Bailey. She's here. She took it upon herself saying, I I'm going to raise some extra money over and above what, what we're doing for the big contribution today. We want to help some preachers. And she and her husband and three children decided to, to say, we're going to ride 75 miles in the month of October, which I think she did. I didn't check her odometer. I got to, I got to trust her on this. And people committed $1 per mile so they could buy a $75 bicycle for people like that. I gave her my check last night. I took part in that. I appreciate what Lauren did on that. Thank you. You're making a difference in the lives of these men and these families right here. We help support those churches. We don't give the preachers very much money at all. I told you about that. We, we encourage the preachers to encourage their congregations to give and support them. We don't have to support them all. We help a little bit with some traveling money, but we want the church members to support their preacher. 
We can't depend upon the people in India to support Mike Rain because here's a congregation of people who needs to take on that responsibility. Am I right? It's the same principle over there in India. We help. Yes, they're poor. They don't have any money. They live on an average of $2 per day. But still, as a church member, they're trying to teach them the responsibility to take care of their preacher. We offer workshops and seminars on a regular basis. This is our classroom there in Suryapet. One of the teachers working with the preachers, the leaders. Uh, when I'm there, they have a big feed. Preachers and their wives come in. We have a big uh, meeting and celebration. We give out the bicycles and sewing machines at that time. Picture of one of the prayer halls, as what they're called in India, a church building. And we help some of the preachers build these. We don't do it for them. We help, they do some. We give a little more, they give a little more. It's a partnership that we have in trying to do mission work among the Indian people. I hope you can see that. These are what we would call the results of what happened in 2020. And I'm a little bit hesitant to show this because we know that God is working behind the scenes in ways that we don't even know. But at the same time, we need some sort of guideline to see what is being done. What are some of the results of the work we're doing? And so you can see here basically what we've just talked about from the television messages right on down. How many requests and studies and seminars and leaders trained, prayer halls built, distributed 12,000 Bibles last year, people baptized 625. I told you 1,000. We were down last year because of COVID. We could not do the necessary follow-up out among the people because things were shut down. The preachers, a, a thousand non-supported preachers, those are the ones who get bicycles. More than 300 congregations are associated with Key, and you can read that for yourself. But that gives you somewhat of a rough idea of just the things that we can count. And making a difference in India. Since we've been working there, we've baptized an estimated 17,000 people. I said, Jonathan, that's great. How many faithful followers and disciples? He said, 15,000. Can't put a cost on that, can you? And if everything were to dry up and, and quit and no more money comes in, the work ceases, I believe that through the help of Farmington and other individuals and churches, we've got 15,000 people who are going to follow Jesus Christ that we didn't have 15 years ago. Is that okay? Where do we go from here? We're going to make more disciples, and develop more leaders, and trust more responsibility to them, and reduce more support. As we reduce more support, hopefully they take on that responsibility to do more for themselves. And so we want this to be a sustainable mission effort. It's going to continue on after we're no longer giving, after we are no longer here. It continues on with their resources and their efforts. As Jonathan and I were, were working last night, he showed me a couple pictures. I had those pictures on my phone in the car. They have a little plot of, of ground. It's not a third of an acre, maybe a quarter of an acre. It's all freshly plowed. They're putting in some kind of a drip system. He said, we're going to grow marigold flowers. Well, that's interesting. And we're going to sell them to have money to do our work. Marigold flowers are, are very important because of the wreaths that are given to the people. You've seen a big wreath that's put around the neck, perhaps, a big garland. Those are made primarily of marigold flowers. 
It's not a lot of money that they're going to make, probably $2,500 a year or so. It's not about the money, but it's about them looking at their own resources. What do they have in their hand? What do they have that they can use to do something for their own mission effort? And I'm excited about that. It's just the fact that they're taking on more responsibility for their own mission work. And so that's where we're going in the future. Continue to do the same things we've been doing and then focus on these four areas. And that's what's happening with the work of key to the kingdom. You can think about the monies that you give today. You can think about the monies you've given in the past couple of years. And you can see how your money has been spent. How it's been used, the impact it's making on those people. And I just want you to know how appreciative I am today of that support. And I speak on behalf of the people you just saw. It's making a difference in their lives. You're touching them, you're blessing them spiritually and physically. We've got roughly five minutes or so. I don't know for sure, but let me open it up for questions, comments on any of this. I've got 10 minutes, okay. I'll take 20. I'm kidding. <laughs> Give me some feedback here. What do you think of, of your, your work? It's our partnership here. Questions? Hey, Brent, yes. Has, has India opened their travel back up, and when do you anticipate going back? Has India opened their travel up? Um, I, I think yes. I was looking last week on some of their websites. The first part of November, they are opening up the borders where people can come in, and you do not have to get a quarantine. Uh, that's good news. We'll see. I, I don't know. Jonathan is checking on all of that for me. I have missed a trip to India in 2020 and also in 21. I normally go at the end of August get back after Labor Day. I'm anxious to go back. And if everything continues to progress in a good way, hopefully I can after the first of the year sometime or may even wait till August. So it's a wait and see. That does not affect our work. I have a Zoom conference with Jonathan every month. We message each other like we're doing last night. We talk on the phone regularly. So Everything's good with that, but it's a matter of getting there and seeing the work once again. Someone once said, one picture is worth a thousand words. In my case, one visit is worth a thousand pictures. So I hope to go back soon. Good question. What, what else? Other thoughts, questions? What did we, what during COVID? What has moved the, the native people here in India, the church, during COVID? They continued on the best they could. Um, they were limited on their travel to visit with the various congregations. But as things began to loosen up, they got to meet again. And it was just limited, but now... Things are pretty much normal. So that's good news. Very few restrictions. I don't see very many masks being worn on the pictures I'm getting. Um, we have lost two of our preachers to death. Others have been in the hospital but have recovered. So we've been affected by that, our, our individual work. But in place of that, we've offered the feeding center and we've continued to give out the various medicines. Uh, so there are some good things that have happened, especially the responses um, over the last year and a half. But hopefully things will get back to normal very soon. Are they harassed very much by other religions? Okay. Are they harassed very much by others? Uh, yes, in certain pockets. We don't experience that much persecution where we are. 
however it is there. I can't do this. That's all right. We operate out of Telegana in the south central part. There we go. Thank you. Most of the persecution that goes on in India is happening in the Orissa state right over here. And we work in Telangana, right to the southwest of that. There are some pockets of persecution that we have to deal with, and I've experienced that myself as far as seeing it. Prime Minister Modi is a hardline Hindu, and he has some of his own people who are called the Hindu Vanta. And they're trying to drive the nation of India back to Hinduism. Now, I've been in places where I'm, I'm teaching, I'm preaching in a village, and down the road come a group of four or five men, and Jonathan said, we need to go. I said, okay, I'm about finished. He said, no, now. And within one minute, we get in the van and we leave. He saw the persecution coming. And there are little situations like that. I've heard of stories of some of our preachers who are persecuted and left to die. I, man, it, it touches my heart. I got the story. I said, Jonathan, we need to move Daniel. He's too vulnerable. He said, brother, he's already recovered, gone back to that same place and continued to preach the gospel to those same people. And four of the five men came to him and repented and he taught and baptized them into Christ. Is that okay? That's the dedication of the preachers in India with whom you are working. We do have some persecution. Not much. In my messages on television, I am able to do that as long as I do not run down Hinduism or Muslims. If I'm preaching out of the Bible, talking about the one true God... It's okay. So I have to be careful. But as long as we're on the up and up and we don't draw too much attention to ourselves as being too big, a threat to Hinduism, we're okay. That's a long answer to your short question, but hopefully it got some more information to you. All right, good. Thank you. What else? That's the first bell. I hear it. We've got 15 more minutes. I mean five, excuse me. I'm giving Jared a hard time. Other comments or thoughts? You've got some good things here going. Thank you. Yes, you know, I'm an American. Um, I don't want them to be responsive to the gospel because of what I'm preaching. I have to be very careful of that. I've never baptized anybody there. I can't. It's against the law. I don't want to get in that water anyway. It's pretty bad. Uh, but I always defer to the local preachers and the work that's going on. Um, and, and they do a good job of following up and teaching after I'm gone. And that's the way we want it to be. You know. Okay. Bicycles, we talked about that. Sewing machines, the feeding center, care center. What's next? Well, I think those four things entrust more responsibility. I am, I'm really trying to get them to do three things. I, I've told Jonathan, I said, I want you to see what's in your hand what's in your home, and what's in your heart. Three H's. What resources do you have here? They came up with the selling marigolds. What resources do you have in your house, in your home? And what's in your heart? What's your passion for this work? I want them to just take on more responsibility. I don't want to, and I don't think it's right for me to direct what they're going to do. I'm a team player. 
And I want them to tell me what they're going to do and how they want to carry on the work. And so I try real hard to listen to them and we work together in partnership. Personally, I want to continue to speak to churches like this to develop more partnerships, to have more money for the future as we do something perhaps even bigger. And that's what I spend a lot of time doing here in America. We have over 80 donors who help key to the kingdom. It's almost 40 individuals and 40 churches. So I've been in about 22 churches this year making a presentation, talking about India and looking to the future. So we're going to continue doing what we've done with the mindset of giving more responsibility to them. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yes, sir. One sewing machine costs $100. We buy them over there. I send the money. They buy them there locally, and it works. It's really $90. We have $10 that goes for the scissors, the material, to get started for those women. So $100 buys one sewing machine. Good question. What else? we got one minute. Yes, ma'am. Giving clothes, I, I can't work with that. Um, the best thing to do is just get the money and buy the clothes over there. Um, I can't haul clothes over there. It's just, it's just not feasible to do. But most of those people would have two or three changes of clothing, the, the, the saris, the Punjabis for the women, uh, men wear the same trousers and shirts. Um, doesn't take much to clothe a person. You could clothe a person for a year for $50 easily. And that would go in that benevolence bucket that we talked about a moment ago. Well, let me just say again, thank you for your partnership. Thank you for the privilege to be here today. I look forward to sharing with you in the next hour. Look forward to meeting and blowing through that $20,000 goal that we have this morning as well. I want to end with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much for another day of life, opportunity to be here today, to receive your blessings, to come together, to worship you, to honor you, to fellowship with one another. I want to thank you especially for this congregation right here, the Farmington Church, for their partnership and the effort of Key to the Kingdom, for the difference these people are making in the lives of so many in India. I'm thankful that we get to work together to advance your kingdom in that place. Bless us today with the rest of our activities, and may you be honored in all that we say and do. In Jesus' name, amen.